ADHD Rewired, Episode 23, Conversations from the Ada Conference, an interview with Linda Rogley. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. Whether you have ADHD and you want to learn more about it, or you are looking for ways to organize your time, your things, or the many details of life so you can get more done, this show is for you. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. So I'm standing here talking to Linda Rogley. It is the Thursday pre-conference. What do you still have to do? Because you have a number of presentations that you are giving. You're going to embarrass me on the air? Yes. Okay, so this is my AD Diva self. I have a survey for adults with ADHD who are over 40, and I really want to get it started, and I have it almost done, and it's not done, but I have lots of pieces of paper printed with the QR code so that people can go there, but we have to finish it up before it goes there. So that's number one. Number two, I have two more presentations to give, one tomorrow, one on Saturday, and neither one of them are ready, which is why I did not send Evelyn my handouts because the handouts are not ready, but I do have my masks for the, for the mini masks of ADHD. And then the other thing is, is that since I'm an exhibitor, I also have a slide show that I'm showing at my booth, and I found that the slideshow that I thought I was going to edit has disappeared, so I have to start over. Before we dive in to today's interview with the AD diva, Linda Rogley, which is honestly one of my favorite interviews from the conference, they were all great, but this is one of the best ones. There are at least a few times during the interview that you are about to hear that there were tears in my eyes and chills kind of going through my body, we got into some pretty uh, emotional, authentic, raw stuff. Uh, She describes how she was first diagnosed, uh, was um, about 20 years ago. She shares with us some of those experiences of really trying to make peace with her diagnosis and really tear away what she describes as the masks of ADHD and really allowing herself to be true to who she really is. So we sat down on the, uh, I think it was a Saturday after she had presented and I had presented. So that, that intro audio clip was actually on Thursday of the conference. So it was a few days after that, what you're about to hear. Um, she talks a little bit about how um, some of her, her prior uh, work experiences in TV and radio, um, and newspaper and advertising. Um, she shares with us some of the things that she still struggles with. And um, she she shared with me, and she didn't actually uh, say this on, um, or maybe she did say it on the interview, but she has a an audio book that's going to be available on audible.com. And it's not yet, but she does have this book out. But you can either go now and get a free download and a 30-day trial of an audiobook of your choice. And hopefully soon, maybe this will be the nudge that Linda needs to submit because she has a 20 or not a 20, a 2,000 word, um, I guess, intro that she needs to give to Audible. And I totally understand how that could be a barrier uh, to submitting something like that. I could definitely relate to something like that. Anyways, this episode is brought to you by audibletrial.com. No, it's brought to you by Audible. You can get a free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. ADHD Rewired listeners, do you want to increase your productivity and get more done? Do you have a specific goal or project that you want to start or want to finish? Does it seem like your to-do list keeps growing even though you feel busy? If you say yes, then join us for the ADHD Rewired online group coaching experience. This group is a 12-week online program where I will provide you with daily productivity coaching with the added power of group accountability. If you are listening during the week of August 11th through August 15th, 2014, 
and you have been waiting for me to announce the launch of this coaching and accountability group, I am offering a pre-launch special of only $5.99 and installment plans are available, but you have to act now to secure your place at this price. Go to ADHDrewired.com and click the iMac picture that says group registration. Check the show notes for a direct link and for a video that will cover this group in detail. Again, that's ADHDrewired.com and prepare to get your ADHD rewired. And now for the interview with Linda Rogley. I am here once again with Linda Rogley. Hi, Linda. How are you? You forgot to say the beautiful Linda Rogley. The beautiful. Oh, thank you so the much. The wonderful, <laughs> the inspiring, the courageous. <laughs> okay, that'll be enough. And, uh, the, it's getting really exhausted? deep. Yeah, exhausted oh. is probably the correct word at this point, yes. But willing and very eager to talk to you and talk to your audience. So, um, you just gave a presentation uh-huh. called um, Coming Out ADHD, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. And usually every year, and I think I even mentioned this on a prior podcast, there's usually one presentation that I sit through that I'm caught off guard and I end up crying. (laughs) You were the one this year. (laughs) That's actually a high honor because the truth is, as you know, I cry too, (laughs) twice. And that's pretty, I think that when I touch that level in me and probably the same applies for you, although I don't know for sure, um, it's because it's the truth. It really resonates mm-hmm. so deeply with me, and I know that that I live into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think the the things of, of wearing that mask, and yeah. uh, you described, and you how you described how sometimes you need to just go to your room and check out from everything because it's exhausting. And I was just relating to to so many of those things. Absolutely, and you know, I just it just occurred to me that the actual title of the presentation was "It's exhausting pretending to be normal every day." So we're both exhausted, but we're talking about it's the, it's the being out in public. Even though I tend to be really an, an extrovert, and I like talking to people, and I do get energy, which is the definition of an extrovert. Right, right. But I I must be on the cusp because it gets to a point where when I when I get away from it. I just have to just call into a little cave for a while and rejuvenate and, and reboot, Recharge. if you will. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like rebooting. And I and I need that. And and when I'm in that place, I don't want anything. I want almost I almost even want to close the shades. I just don't want any more distraction. I don't want any stimulus. I just need to kind of regroup and be inside me so that I can you know protect me and then be strong again so that I can go out there and be my lovely mm-hmm. extroverted self again. <laughs> it's a roller coaster. Yeah. And- <laughs> So part of self-acceptance is being okay with yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so where, where are you with that? Because you've been, how long ago were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed a long time ago, actually. I'm, it, it, it surprises me that I keep saying, oh, yeah, it's 12 years. Now it's 15 years. But actually, I was diagnosed almost 17, almost 20 years okay. ago. I mean, Sarah Seldon's book about women and ADHD came out. So you were diagnosed out. when you were one? I was di- thank you for that. That's so sweet of you. And that's his radio, so you guys can't even tell whether that's true or not. That's except, although I don't have this vocabulary, so I'm actually two. So um, I was diagnosed when I was about 45, 46, somewhere in that vicinity. And that was perimenopause for me. So... Um, I, as I said in the presentation, I laughed at the psychologist who suggested that I had ADHD, and I immediately went right to the bookstore that he suggested to buy the book that he suggested to look at it to prove him wrong. Because by God, that's for little kids, and that's for you know people who can't sit still, and I could do all that, and blah blah blah. And I bought the book and was actually reading it at the stoplights on the way home. I was so taken with it and so convinced that it was actually talking about me. And that, yet, was, that was one of the moments that was getting me. That was my first. I didn't officially cry at that point, but I was getting watery eyed because driven, it was driven by distraction. Driven, driven to distraction. That was the, my first book too. And I can remember be, being at my parents' house, uh, I think it was in between semesters of school, um, sitting on the bed, reading through that book. And at that, that point, I could probably count how many books I've actually read on one hand. Yeah. And just not being able to stop. And it was, mm-hmm. it was like, 
I had to stop to dry my eyes, yeah. you know, because it was like, oh my, this is this was he's been spying on me because this book is about yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I cried and I laughed and and yet there were parts of the book that didn't fit me. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, maybe this guy's wrong after all. But then there, I'd read more and the oh, maybe it is true or maybe it isn't true. And then I think there's like a hundred questions at the back or something, and most of them seemed like they really fit me, mm-hmm. but I didn't want them to fit me mm-hmm. because I'd been diagnosed with depression my entire life, and my mom had been diagnosed with depression, and I didn't want to be my mom. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be better, so I wasn't going to take antidepressants. I was going to be Mr. Strong, Miss Strong, and all that kind of good stuff. So to find out it was ADHD all that time didn't really feel real to me, mm-hmm. and it took me two more diagnoses to actually believe that I actually had it. I had to go to three people, and it had to be a real test on paper with a computer, blah, blah, blah. So it wasn't because you forgot the first two results? No, it wasn't because <laughs> I forgot them. It's just that I wouldn't, did, I was denying, you know, that river called denial. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't, and, and the truth is, is that it kept smacking me in the face. You know, once you, and I said this before, once you ring that bell, once you know ADHD is possible for adults, then when it comes up and smacks me in the face, I'm more aware that that's what it is. Mm-hmm. But as I say, when I finally got that diagnosis, it was like taking one piece of binary code in a computer, changing one zero out of those ones and zeros, and then everything behind it is different because I looked at it through the lens of ADHD, and everything forward is now going to be through that lens of ADHD. Mm-hmm. And I always say, you know, duh, it, I'm not passive aggressive. I'm not other oriented. I'm not bipolar. I'm none of those things mm-hmm. that I was labeled after all those 20 years of therapy. What I am is ADHD, and you know what? It's just ADD. It won't kill you unless it does, because ADHD can be really serious. And I will be—I'm going to be very candid with your audience. I have been seriously suicidal. It—it it just happened, and I had no idea at that point because that was before my diagnosis why that would be. So it's, we had, it's tough. I think the, the first um, interview that I actually did was with a, one of our listeners, yeah. who sent me a, a really emotional uh, email, um, basically sharing with us that. Um, he had attempted suicide more than once, mm-hmm. and he heard my podcast, and it was like an aha moment for him. Oh, and he, and he was hardly. struggling with with alcoholism, and now he's, he's been dry. But I talked to him about a week or two ago, and it's been I think it's about four months now. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah, I mean it's, it's, just, it's so. I think you should probably keep doing these podcasts. Yeah, you think? <laughs> you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. I can tell you how many listeners have made me cry, but by the emails. Yeah. I, if you guys aren't uh, getting by now, I'm, I tend to be a crier. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that shows your heart, and that's the authenticity that I was talking about in this session. Because if we are able to come out of our ADHD closets and take off some of that thick wall of of I'm I'm going to be the intellect, or I'm yeah, going to be the, just, that was so powerful hearing that. Yeah. That's a, a coping strategy and an ego mm-hmm. defense mechanism that sure. I've used for a long time. That's the intellectualization of everything. Mm-hmm. And I was realizing that were, there are things that should I, like I intellectually am upset about, but I'm not feeling it. And it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't feel good. You know, I talk like, about it. I talk about it like everything above your ears is all that brain stuff going, chit, 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 and then below your ears is the rest of your body. Mm-hmm. And when you can get, you can actually let yourself be in your body because so many times with ADD, I'm kind of out there. I'm out. Like, I'm just so you guys can't see, but I'm actually doing my hands out in front of me in big circles because I'm out there trying to talk to them, trying to be with them, instead of actually paying attention to what's going on for me. Mm-hmm. So for me to be able to do that has been an amazing situation. And I want to tell your, your listeners something that a wise, wise therapist told me a long time ago, and you may tell your, your clients this as well, but that was if I'm sitting down and I'm totally out of my body, if I can wake up to the fact that I'm like ah, free, fried, then all I have to do is lean back against the chair. And feel the chair against my back. And just that simple act of noticing my body mm-hmm. is in space. And so, even if you're standing, you can mm-hmm. feel your feet on the floor. That mindfulness. It yeah. actually, yeah, but I don't call it mindfulness for me because then okay. it sounds like it's all woo-woo and then I have to do something with it. Do you know what? Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Because... All I needed was this, just that little mm-hmm. instant reminder. I don't have to keep it up. I just have to, even when I do it and I take a breath, suddenly my speech even slows down always, a little bit. You can always look for your breath. It's always there. Yeah, that's true. Thank goodness until that very last one. Speaking of aliens and, and ADHD. <laughs> um, Where did we go? <laughs> I realized that um, I don't think I, I introduced your name I don't think I actually you said anything about who you actually are because I'm sure that there are people who've never heard of you oh I doubt it I'm pretty famous (laughs) 
And they do know I'm beautiful. <laughs> so that's probably enough. But my, actually, let me, so let me, let me. Internet famous, right? Internet famous, right. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I do that at a webinar, so lots of people in the ad organization do know who I am. And I do webinars from the AD Diva Network. So let me just kind of rewind just a little bit. Linda Rogley actually rhymes with Linda Dogley. So people see my name and they don't know how to pronounce it. And it's not Rogley, it's Rogley, it's not Rogoli, and it's not Rogeli, and all that kind of stuff. It's Linda Rogley, and that's how I remembered it when I, I met so, my I husband. I can so relate to that, because I've, I've been Eric Tivers for I'm so long. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have. Which if you didn't have that E in there, it'd be okay. But it rhymes with rivers. There you, that's true. It, that's see? true. There you go. There you go. So I found that I had ADD, and as I say, when I was in my mid-40s, and that was perimenopause for me. Mm-hmm. Now I know, then I did not, but now I know that when estrogen goes away, whether that's during your period or whether it's at menopause when it kind of goes bye-bye forever, mm-hmm. um, it, estrogen sits on the receptor site of the neurotransmitters, and when those little neurotransmitters are going, bam, right over there really quickly, you take the estrogen out, and they kind of wander around like, Slow oh down a bit, because gosh. what you're saying is so important. Okay, let me slow down. Estrogen, lack of estrogen, increases ADHD symptoms. That's the bottom line. And it happens monthly for a lot of women. So people think they have PMS and they can't pay attention, especially right before your period starts. It's just like gone. Your brain is gone. If you're taking a test on that day, if you're a student, Mm -hmm. you might want to ask for a different day simply because you're not connecting. And some some psychiatrists actually increase medicine or change medication Mm -hmm. for women who are still having menstrual periods. For me, losing that estrogen... I actually had closed my advertising agency because I was just fried. I just mm. couldn't do it anymore. And even though it's something I love doing because it was something different every day. It sounded like an ADD dream. I do something different every day. It's creative. I have you know all these cool awards on the wall, all that kind of good stuff. But I would sit in the parking lot every day and I would cry. Mm. And then I would dry my tears and I would go upstairs and I would be the boss for the day. And then after the employees would leave, my day would start. And I would stay there all night long. I even had a little little foam rubber thing that I slept on at the office sometimes when we had things that were due the next day. Advertising is a very deadline driven business. When I look back on my careers, I realize every single one of them was an ADD compensation. Mm. I worked in radio and TV. You have to be on the air at the right time or you're not going to be there. Not I like podcasts when you can actually put it on when you want to put mm-hmm. it on. Um, I worked in newspaper, so that's also a deadline. And I was worked on the morning paper, and I, by George, I always slipped in just under the wire or just over it. And then I worked in advertising. So when I look at that and when I realized what I was doing, I thought, oh, my gosh, that was one of those things I looked back on and said, oh, ADD. That mm-hmm. was about my ADD. So being late is one of my big issues and it's one of my husband's it's one of the real things that only things that my husband really gets upset about with me mm-hmm. especially when I cause us to miss airplanes to Spain oh, no. oh yeah twice this is why I like neurotically get to their airport like obscenely early yeah good for you because like I hate traveling because it's like one transition after another after another it is so as an accommodation for myself yeah. I get to conferences a day early Good for you. Good for you. It's more expensive. I'm away from my family for a day longer, so yeah. that, that stinks. But it, it's an accommodation because my first Chad conference five years ago, mm-hmm. I you know I, I landed, got into my room, and it was like go time, and I was like oh, never again. Wow. Never. I, I, it was like I was. It was like an outer body experience. I was well, like, it sounds like we kind of circled back to what we talked about to begin with. Was me needing some downtime? Mm-hmm. You needed downtime to actually kind of get back in your body and, and be your authentic mm-hmm. self. From just from the travel, and let's face it, conferences are very intense. There's lots of information coming at you, lots of people who want to talk to you, lots of people you want to talk to. Mm-hmm. So you're out there a lot, and being able to go back in here. So as I said, I miss a lot of some com- a lot of conversations I'd really like to be having because during the breaks, I actually take a break. I actually go back to the room. I drink water. I lay down for a little bit, or maybe I check email, and that's probably more often Yesterday the case than not. Yesterday at one o'clock, I took a thirty minute power nap. Good for I you. I was so glad that I did that. Yeah, exactly. Again, taking such good care of yourself. So I love the fact that you're modeling that for your listeners. I I, I don't get to bed on time most nights. Could could we just take that acknowledgement? So I want to tell you a little bit. You're totally right, Linda. Thank you. I I want to tell you a little bit about the AD Diva Network. Because when I was diagnosed with ADHD and finally came to grips with the fact that, yes, I really do have it, 
what I realized is that there wasn't much out there for women. And Sherry Seldon's book was out, and Terry Matlin's book was out, mm-hmm. but there really wasn't very much else out there for women. And moreover, when I would read books about ADHD, they were full of pathology. They were full of the bad news about mm-hmm. ADHD. There was a lot of research going on, and I understand that we needed to do that research, and we needed to say that it was bad news so that the world would take it seriously. Because otherwise, they could just dismiss it as saying, oh, that's just an excuse, or any of the other things that they dismiss ADD with. So what I realized is that I wanted to be one of the people that helped open the door to a more positive spin on ADHD. So I have t-shirts that, that take all of the negative pathology-driven words with for ADHD, like impulsivity, and I translate them into positive words like spontaneity. Passion is part of what we do. Mm-hmm. Creativity is simply is simply. Um, something that that is negative that's used in the negative world as you know well we're impulsive or we're you know we're hyper focused or whatever well but that's kind of creativity you Mm -hmm. have to have that that's problem solving kinds of things so i knew i wanted to do it i was lucky enough because it was early in the add kind of adult experience because it's about 10 years ago um that the that the title ad diva was was still available and it wasn't available as a dot com so it was available as a dot net so i came up with the fact that this was the ADD of a network for women. And I wanted to focus on women who were my age, which was, I call them 40 and better. But um, now, actually, they're more like 50 and better, to tell you the truth, is what's happening. Because a lot of women now who are in their 40s were diagnosed in their 20s. -hmm. I deal mostly with women and and some men, too, who are diagnosed later in life, after childhood and after early Mm -hmm. adulthood, for instance. And so what I wanted to do, and Ned Hallowell was kind of out there with this positivity piece, and he was being ridiculed left and right for it. Mm -hmm. People said, that's ridiculous. You know, hey, there's nothing good about ADHD and we don't want to hear it. And I thought, ooh, this is a little dangerous territory for me. I was certainly not as well known as he was. Nobody knew who I was in those days. I I had an email list of like 13, I think. Um, So... How many, how many of those were family members? Um, actually, none, because I didn't want to tell my family about <laughs> oh. my ADHD. Oh. So these were just the people who were working for me, actually. Um, <laughs> I was paying them to be on the list. <laughs> I, I don't think it's supposed to work that way. I don't, no, I don't either. But fortunately, it's changed. Thank God. We have thousands of women on the, on the ADD right. network now. And, and thank you so much. I appreciate that. And and I do believe that, that I, I've created a real tribe because women actually wear their T-shirts. They call themselves AD Divas. And they do that because... There, there's, even though there's more information and more resources for women and for all adults with ADHD, there's still not always that positive focus. Mm-hmm. So I joined, I, I was always, I worked with Jack Canfield long ago, and one of the things that always interested chicken me. Chicken soup guy, right? Yeah, yeah, but he was, that was way before the chicken soup. And he said something, and what, now this is how long ago it's been, it was tapes. It was cassettes that I put in the car that my kids said, no, we don't have to listen to that again, do we? I was in my second divorce. I married the same man twice, and I was divorced from him for the second time, and I knew something had to change. So I listened to his. Oh, I have to tell you the quick story. Is it all right if I tell you the quick of story course. about we, this? We like Hutchins, actually. Okay, good. All right, perfect. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was working at the news. I was working at the newspaper at the time. I was I was the, a reporter, education reporter, and I was also the film critic, as a matter of fact. And I was pretty stressed out. I was a single mom, and and I signed up for one of those $79 like skill path seminars, right? Mm-hmm. And it was stress and women. And I asked for the day off. And instead of taking the day off, I forgot. And I showed up at work. And, and they said, why are you here? And I said... I thought I was working. And they said, you're going to the stress and women section. So, of course, I got there two hours late. I did drive over. I walked in. Everyone else was sitting there. They had their friends with them. I walk in. I'm late. I'm embarrassed. Uh, I don't have anybody. I don't know anybody. I, nobody goes to lunch with me. I'm just, it was just one of those, ooh, I'm a bad person and nobody. And, and I deserve it, right? Because I forgot again. Again, this is before I was diagnosed with ADHD, long before. And... When I got back in, I, was, I, I wasn't present in the room, do you know? Because I was still kind of in that, oh, I'm late, and oh my gosh, and who are these people? I did this. Yeah, exactly. So I was still kind of floating around the room in my brain. And finally in the afternoon, I was exhausted because so much information had been coming at me. But they were selling things at the back of the room, which is how they make their money. They don't make it on the $79, that's for right. sure. And Jack Canfield had something about success with, you know, the, the road to success or something like that. And I bought it because I thought, well, if nothing else, at least I can get something out of this. And so I bought it. And that's what I listened to over and over until the tapes actually literally wore out. I know you like to listen and learn. Right now, you're probably in the car or working out or doing something else while you are listening to this podcast. Podcasts are great, but if you really want to dive in deep, you can read or listen 
to an audiobook, just like Linda listened to Jack Canfield's The Success Principle. You don't ever have to worry about tapes wearing out or CDs scratching. Just download Jack Canfield's book or Sari Solden's Women with ADD for free. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free 30-day trial and a free audiobook download. That's audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Check show notes for the link or open your podcasting app that you're listening to this with right now and you'll find show notes there with a clickable link. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. And now back to the interview with Linda Rogley. <laughs> And what I was getting to, coming all the way back around in my ADD-ish way. I was really wondering, are you going to make we're it back? Getting, we're getting back to it. Is He said something that has always intrigued me, and that is that there was research that proved that positive thoughts could actually change your brain. Oh, of course. Yeah. And I had no, yeah, well, you say, of course, but back, in, back, in, sure. two, and back in 19, early 1990, that but was not. Course. Yeah, exactly. Uh. <laughs> so. I took that to heart as well as, as something I'd kind of stored in the back of my brain, and I wanted to know more. I wanted I wanted some facts. I'm not a researcher, but I do want some validity. I don't just want this to be this airy fairy. Oh, let's feel better. Oh, yeah, we'll just make ourselves happy. So I went looking for it. So I joined the International Positive Psychology Association, even though I'm not a psychologist. And I went to their first international conference. I was blown away. It was so amazing, and it's everything that I do with coaching. So the AD Diva Network, my coaching. Positive psychology, my women's retreats, which I hadn't mentioned, but my men, my women's retreats, which are transformational retreats, all are pulled together by this by this string of, you know what, you are fine just the way you are, and this is true whether you have ADD or whether you have OCD or whether you're what we we kind of almost nastily say neurotypical. Um, you actually are okay. And I think one of the things I talked about in this in the presentation mm-hmm. I just did was wearing kind of the mask, if you will, having that persona out there. And I love that you dressed up, by the way, and had I someone did. behind the curtain, actually. I did. She was handing, handing, my, handing me my costumes. And the, the whole time I was, you know, I shared that with you, that I was just so glad that I wasn't that person that was <laughs> trapped in this small space handing you. I, I would have And it was out. dark and black. Yeah, and I, I mean, w- it was like scary. Very, I, I would have very. wanted to know what are people thinking, what are they doing, like, get me out of here. And she kept talking behind the curtain, and they could hear her, and then everybody loved it. It was just, it was perfect. It was perfect. But she kept, she, she kept handing me the wrong wig and the wrong this and the wrong that. So yes, I had, I had pink dyed hair, and I had Hulk Hogan, and I had no, it was well, whatever I had. Anyway, it was the big, the the big green guy who's really angry. I had, I had wonderful things. My favorite was the court jester because I had got to wear a court jester, and that was the life of the party. But all of those are masks. All of those are personas that we put on to protect ourselves, and we develop different ones. We kind of sometimes trade them back and forth but mine was on so tightly when I was a child and even into adulthood that I had to be perfect I was smart I knew where I was going I was driven the problem was is that I kept falling out on the job and I kept trying to hide it behind that mask but unfortunately I'll never forget at a conference I was there were people who believed the mask right they had bought Mm -hmm. they bought the story which was kind of still silly on their part but I did a good job I'm a very good actress (laughs) so they bought the story and I had a meltdown and one of them looked at me and said I didn't know you were like this and I just was crushed I was just I felt so yeah now she's finally seeing the real me kind of thing but even that part was, even when that persona came down, that wasn't the real me. That was the damaged, I can't do it right me. The person that I came to know, the person that I am so, it's a miracle that this person ever was allowed to emerge, that I gave her permission to emerge, is a woman who really trusts herself. And I think trust is a very, very difficult word for a lot of folks with ADHD. And that's why, that's one of the reasons I decided to do this, because after a while, I realized that the things I was learning began to make a circle. And I was coming back to the same ideas. And all of a sudden, it was like, at first, it was like, I want to learn, I want to learn, I want to learn. And all of a sudden, they began to make sense. And they began to be collective. And they began to be something that I could put my arms around. And so one day, I was driving down the road near my house. And all this, the thought just came to me, you know what? You actually have a little bit of wisdom. You've actually climbed above the canopy of trees, and you actually can see the sun, just a little peak of the sun. Even if I'm not all the way up to the top of the tree, even just being above that kind of incredible confusion and that jungle maze of where you can't see anything and slashing your way through, 
I could see a little bit of something up there. And I knew because I, mm-hmm. but I knew that if I could do it, anyone could do it. And that's how I often feel too. And I'm working with clients. Like I, my, my tendencies are to be a disorganized mess that doesn't, that loses track of time and doesn't get anything done. Yeah. Those are my tendencies. Yeah. And I talked in my presentation today about um, that one of the challenges with ADHD is that we often try to go on autopilot. Mm-hmm. And we have the button, but it's not connected to anything. <laughs> <laughs> I love that phrase. That's great. I like that. So we have to be so intentional about everything that we really want to do and what we don't want to do. That's right. That's well, right. So it's, I mean, in my, in my office at um, in my clinic, I have four or five clocks and a bunch of timers and they're all going and i you know i share with my clients and the first time they walk into my office you're going to see these timers and they're going to be going off and it's mm-hmm. cueing me and you know if it helps you and let me know if it's distracting to you let me know and mm-hmm. we'll work it out so it works for both of us oh that's good that's cool i did a presentation yesterday about let's fix it which i kind of covered the whole gamut of treatment options for adhd but mm-hmm. my favorite part of that is the gadget part and, and I, I wanted to ask you about that because okay. I, I didn't realize that you were a gadget geek like me oh my gosh yes i love gadgets and i'm always finding new ones. That's why I'm wearing my new fitness band, which is tracking my sleep and it's tracking my steps. And I actually found an app that's a weight. I'm, I'm doing Weight Watchers because I really do. As beautiful as I am, well. I need to still lose a little weight and get into shape. And and it will now let me scan food and give me all the points and all Ooh. that. kind. Of, I mean, yeah, it's the it, it's almost scary how cool things are and then how destructive it is when they stop working. I just, it makes me... I, I, I love technology, and nothing drives me crazier than when it fails. It drives me absolutely bananas. When the actual technology fails. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I've been, I've been underneath a lot of desks in my life with cords, plugging them in and trying to make them work. And um, back in the old days when I actually learned how to do computers, Microsoft tech support was free. I literally have been on the phone with Microsoft tech support back in the old days for 11 or 12 hours at a time. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that was it. They were, I would fry network cards. I would do this. And finally, I said, I'm, I'm buying apples. That was when the Apple finally had the, had the power PCs. But um, nonetheless, the, the gadgets, when you mentioned clocks, it reminds me, I love atomic clocks. And I have clocks everywhere. I have clocks in the bathroom. I have two or three clocks atomic everywhere. Clocks, that's, that's what like goes automatically they based do. on... And I don't have to reset them for daylight savings time. Brilliant. And they reset themselves Brilliant. when the when the light goes up. And they have, I, as long as I remember to replace the battery, <laughs> even the alarm clocks to go off. But interestingly enough, I don't use alarm clocks. I don't like that nagging, beep, 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 or even music. And I you know, hate alarms. Interesting, clocks. because one of the things I often encourage people to do is think about if the things that we need those alarms in a sense for mm-hmm. are things that we often have a negative association That's with. That's true. That's so, very true. So pairing positively associated sounds mm-hmm. for our alarms, I think, is really, really important. Yeah. I use a, uh, an app called Sleep Cycle that tracks my... my uh, my sleep. I've and used that too, but this is better. <laughs> so I've heard. So I've heard. And I've, been, I've had my eye on one of those for the, the Fitbit for a long time. Because yeah. they would, I probably this is should not, up. I should not have, what is that one? This is Up24. Okay. It's like the, this is Job One. Okay. Yeah. Have you used the other one? No, I haven't. And I'm going to tell you why. Because they recalled them. There was some big thing going on with them. And I, I will tell you that I just heard this story that a woman had a Fitbit on. She was traveling. And she took it off because she thought it would make the thing alarm. And she's still alarmed. Her arm was still magnetized from the band. And I like, uh oh, I don't what? think I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm not kidding you. She still set the alarms off when she had taken it off of her arm. So I was grateful that I had bought up and set a Fitbit. And you know, it may be something that they're just going to work on. They did have a recall of them, but somebody told me there's some new one. There's some. There's stuff coming out all the time. Mm-hmm. So I uh, there was something I was going to tell you about the oh about the atomic clocks, but also about timers. Um, I don't like timers all that much either okay. um because i don't like them to me there's just like a nagging voice and i really 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 don't like it now i do set a few timers because and i have a clock literally on my computer that's a big analog face mm-hmm. not digital analog mm-hmm. face which is makes it easier for me to set things but and it goes off every half hour and every hour so it, it allows me to know the passage mm-hmm. of time but the one timer that i really like looks really old-fashioned it's actually a tibetan bell Mm-hmm. And it sits on a piece of wood, and it 
frankly, is, it was there's a timer, but there's also uh, one for to be used for your phone. You can actually plug it into your phone, so your phone actually sounds like a Tibetan bell. It actually has a ring on Tibetan bell. That's my that's my phone. That's my ringtone. Is, is that right? Uh-huh. Cool. Well, it's the same. I don't like the phone. Yeah, there so, you go. There so you I'm, go. I created a positive association. Perfect. With it. Perfect. Yeah. Exactly. So all I do is turn it. And the cool thing about this is that there's something about sacred geometry in terms of the way this goes. So let's say I set it for an hour. So in an hour, it'll go off and I don't do anything about it. And I just leave it there. And in another 12 minutes, it'll go off again. And then the next time, it's half of that. In six more minutes, it'll go off. And then three more minutes, Mm -hmm. it goes off. And then at the very end, when it gets down to one minute, it just rings constantly. So I have no choice except to turn it off and get something. On on, um, sleep cycle, that's how their intelligent alarm uh, sneeze function works. That's exactly right. So you get the first thing is 12 minutes and half of that and half of that. Yep. That's exactly right. The other thing I've always been interested in are the clocks that have the globe on top that gradually get um, brighter and brighter and brighter Mm -hmm. so that you actually, because that that melatonin issues, you know, it's either shut down or wake or being woken up. Um, That's something I've really have. I actually bought one, but in in those bad old days, it was, it was not a good way to, the alarm didn't work very well. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried it lately, but you know, I'm really shocked. I have to tell you that I'm not getting near as much sleep as I thought I was getting. And my husband has cystic fibrosis, so he coughs a lot during mm. the night. And what I found is that when I'm in a hotel and he's not with me, I sleep much better. And that's not, that's, I love my husband, don't get me wrong here. But it's because that sound wakes me up, wakes me up, wakes me up. I didn't realize until the chat conference about a year ago when a, a friend of mine, another uh, psychologist actually, um, slept in the same twin king size bed with me because she her, her roommate was snoring she couldn't get any sleep and she was sleeping with me and she said that every time my email was coming in which would ding or something like that she said every time that happened you would wake up and i didn't uh, even know that oh my so God. now i know to turn it off but the information i'm getting from this band is just really cool and how accurate it is i have no idea but it's better than what i was getting before which was nothing so anyway so yeah i'm very much a gadget gal and my favorite gadget that I wake up and hug every day is my brother labeler. Everything in my house and everything in my life is labeled. Really? Everything. Like? Light swi- oh, light switches, bottles. Um, if you look at things I travel with, everything is labeled. This is shampoo, this is conditioner, this is moisturizer, all that kind of stuff. Well, that kind of makes sense because mm-hmm. you're out of your, you put it in a different bottle. But we have everything labeled. I mean, on the, on the um, spice cabinet, there is a thing that goes around. And on the outside of the little ro- ro- you know, thing that, that rotates... Um, it'll say salt and paprika, and this, so that when I get it out, I know exactly where to put it. Right, back. so you don't have to like, where does it go again? Exactly, or I get, and I don't. I, 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 I label things about very stuff consistently, stuff. and it's great when I do. <laughs> well, I will tell you that it takes time to do that. Yeah. And, and I've spent um, really literally years doing it. Um, but now everyone in my household knows where's the labeler. I mean, and now I have like six of them. You know, we've got to have one in every floor, one in every room Great. almost. Because it's, and, and I will tell you the reason why that's, imp- I mean, labeling is important, right? And people say, well, just use a piece of scotch, uh, you know, masking tape. Doesn't my handwriting, Yeah, but my handwriting is so bad that I couldn't be able, I couldn't read it. I'm married mm-hmm. to a doctor. His handwriting's better than mine. So when we go to the grocery store and I write down that we need pasta, he thinks we need paste because he just, I mean, and here's the other interesting thing. And I haven't said this to anybody that I know of, but I've noticed it. When I write, I don't finish the end of the words. Like, all right, all right, wrongly, but I won't put the L-I on the end of it. I don't finish sentences sometimes when I write. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really amazing, isn't it? Or I'll repeat a word to sometimes even three times. I didn't oh, even notice wow. that I did that. Well, and that's probably, and lots of people aren't, aren't able to read that when they see this, the word repeated and so forth mm-hmm. and so on. The other thing I learned about uh, dysgraphia, which is what I turned, which is what, there's actually a name for mm-hmm. really bad handwriting like mine. Um, one of the, there are several different versions of dysgraphia, and one of them, one of them didn't make any sense to me. Another one, what, that did make sense was people can write if they're really focused on it, but then the longer they write, the worse their handwriting gets, which mm-hmm. is true for me. But the other one that was interesting to me was spatial. So if you're addressing an envelope and you get to the end and, and you're kind of you don't have enough room, I don't I don't have a good judgment of Either how big I. things are gonna how long things are gonna be. When I do um, when my wife and I got married and we had to send our thank you notes out, yeah, 
I had to um, use a straight edge to say <laughs> that's great. But you know, at least you did it though, mm-hmm. and that's and I think that's what's important for everybody to know is that we all screw up. It doesn't make a difference whether we're professionals or not. We're not the leader with head and shoulders above everybody else. We're just like you, mm-hmm. and we may have some different coping mechanisms, and we may have access to different coping mm-hmm. mechanisms. But you figured out you figured that out yourself, right? Nobody wrote, wrote that in a book and said, "Here's what you need to do to make sure that you stay straight lines." We're so creative, and we come up with those solutions, and which is one thing I love about ADHD. I told you that half of the people I talk to want to get rid of it, half the people want to keep it, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of on the fence. I love it sometimes, and I don't love I it sometimes. In the same way, I think that you know how hard certain things are, and how much effort I have to put into certain things. Yeah, there are certainly um, times that I wish that I didn't have it. Right. You know, there is still debate on whether or not creativity is it is or is not associated with it. Yeah, it's supposed find, to be not necessarily. Yeah, you know, it's it's. I'm just not convinced either way yet. Mm. You know what I mean? But I I think. How that, do you measure creativity, though? That's the thing. So you know, I think about how I learned to say play piano. Mm-hmm. So I was about four or five years old when I started playing, and I was. I was in the basement of my house playing Nintendo, mm-hmm. and I got bored of the Nintendo game, so I left on the Nintendo game to figure out this, the music for the Nintendo game. Oh. And so I played all by ear. Wow. And I never actually learned to read music. Even though Isn't I, that I, something? I took lessons a little bit, but I kind of faked being able to actually read sure. it. I my teacher would play it one time, and I knew how to play it. You... I'm so glad you told me that because I did not know the story of how you began to play because and I figured it was something along those lines. I figured my uncle also has that ability to mm-hmm. just sit down and just play any honky tonk kind of thing mm-hmm. you want, and that's it's amazing how what kind of and and I don't necessarily relate that to creativity to be honest with you. I think that's an innate talent for you, but creativity to I, first of all I asked I asked the question how do you measure creativity? And I'm sure some t- some scientist has measured it. I'm mm-hmm. sure there's some way to do that, but I think that the creativity moniker gets put on ADHD partly because we have to be um, we, we we have to look for different ways around things and it, that looks creative but really we're just trying to take care of ourselves we're just trying to keep ourselves upright most of the time mm-hmm. and and sometimes that takes a lot of effort and, and you go around the you know your elbow to get to your knee and that kind of stuff so um, I just wanted to tell you one thing quick thing though because I think that your that your your listeners might enjoy it is that my husband's absolutely fabulous he hasn't always been fabulous he he got there um, we worked on that together so you know I don't want to give him up because now that he's here and now that I'm here, we want to keep it. But I always used to tell him that um, what I want on my tombstone is never a dull moment because as far as I'm concerned, I mean, that's kind of goes back to creativity, but it also has to do with, you know, I just have energy. I go here, I go there. And probably my hyperactivity is probably stronger than many other women's hyperactivity at this stage of life. Uh, Well, a little, but actually I'm combined because I need that downtime and and I can be just as inattentive. I'm not sure if you pick up on the sarcasm. Yeah. Oh, t- <laughs> okay. If you think so. So I. I mean, just from the, you know the, the, you can, I think talk faster than the Energizer Bunny. Yes, that's true. That's but I should, true. But I just you know for me one of the things that I have to to it's funny. Are that you going to let me tell the end of the story? I'm going to interrupt you because I have ADHD. Okay. Well, <laughs> let me t- at least tell the end of the story because it's only one line. I want to put. I want to put. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no. I wanted to say never a dull moment, right? Yes, yes. And that was that. I said, and I told him that, and he said, no, no, no. What you're going to put on your tombstone? If you go before me, I'm going to write finally done. Hmm. Because I never oh finish. I have T-shirts that say D L N E is my favorite four-letter word. <laughs> I just never get there. <laughs> That's going to make me cry again. <laughs> I actually thought it was kind of cute. <laughs> cute makes me cry. I don't <laughs> <laughs> See, I needed to share that with you. So now you can interrupt all you want. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm just going to be present for a moment. Just all right, take please. That Let's actually, why don't we ask everyone to do that? If you could all just take a breath. If you're sitting, feel the back against your chair. If you're back against the chair. And let's just breathe for just one moment. Hmm. I'm not sure I'm going to talk more more slowly, but I'll try. I think I needed more than one breath. <laughs> you know, it's funny. My the fact that most of what I do professionally is I talk. You know, when yeah, I'm talking that's individually true. with clients or giving yeah. presentations, and I'm a mumbler. Really? I'm a mumbler. Oh. So I have to be very. And it's actually it's interesting when I think about slowing my speech down. Mm. I can think more clearly. That's kind of the same way with me. I agree. 
So you have to be conscious of that is yeah. what I'm hearing. Yeah. You have to be really conscious. And I think I've definitely gotten better, but yeah. I, but it's so funny. I'm I frequently, I'm in the car with my wife, and her, her most frequent word to me is, what? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> and I think part of it, it's, it's the modulation of tone, like not being loud enough. And yeah. I think there's a whole, I mean, I think part of that has to do with, with almost a... Um, Possibly like a, a low muscle tone. You know, my, my oh, son maybe. has some low muscle tone, and I'm seeing yeah. oh, it's some similarities that I'm seeing. Interesting. And, yeah, so being able to modulate, I don't have the greatest voice that projects. Mm. I'm working on it, and I know that a lot of it has to do with breathing. And yeah, it does. Because I'm, I'm involved in Toastmasters now, which has been amazing. Oh, cool! That's have, great. Have you ever done? No, actually, I actually am a um, as a certified instructor for Speaking Circles International. Okay. Which is um, actually being it's full presence communication, which is being completely present and then speaking, speaking, letting the words just bubble up mm-hmm. rather than from the ears down. It's actually coming from the I mean, the ears up. It's actually coming from the ears down. And it comes you know, th- those words come out, and you can use it. You can use it even in real speeches. It's mm-hmm. not just this hocus pocus, woo woo kind of thing. But yeah, Toastmasters is really cool so I'm really glad about that for you but I have to tell you that when I was a kid I was loud and I was so shamed for that and I was told over and over and over again you're too loud you're too loud not just by teachers but by kids Mm -hmm. that I got so soft that people would have to they wouldn't be able to hear me either but it wasn't my natural voice but I, I suppressed it for so long that I lost it. I don't, I don't have that loudness anymore. It's, it's hard for me to be loud. Isn't hmm. that, yeah, that makes me sad about about that little girl who, who didn't get to be fully expressed in the way that she needed to be because it didn't please anyone else. I don't know if I ever shared this story with my listeners, but when I was in, um, in preschool, I came home from preschool one day and told my mom that I have a new name. Mm-hmm. My new name was Don't Eric. Oh, honey. And I get <laughs> That's like down boy for the dog. <laughs> and I, I suppose the way I said it, like it was just kind of a very matter of fact kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not... sure. There was no emotion for you. You just thought that was it. Yeah. Yeah. I but got they call it. Me don't, Eric. Oh, that's so sweet. And it's sad, too. Yeah. So all of us have that, whether you have ADD or not. There are always something that you've, something that you've done, somebody that's going to correct you for something that is more about them than it is about you. Almost always, I think that is the case. And so the, the problem, Eric, I think, is that when we get to be adults, we carry that with us. So I call it the monitor. Mm-hmm. Um, I got turned on to it by a woman who was saying, you know, you need to listen to the voice in your head. You, know, you listen to your mind, right? Mm-hmm. It's monitor your mind, that kind of stuff. But for me, it was the monitor because it was the one that was saying, don't do this. Don't stand too close. Oh, you're, are they, are, do they want to hear from you? Do, maybe they don't want to. You're standing too close. Do, 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 do. And it was monitoring me socially, especially, mm-hmm. all the time. And when I woke up... Up to that, I real, I but I yeah, because it was two different levels of consciousness for me because I was doing it and I was telling myself mm-hmm. to do it, and I'm not sure that it's completely gone, but I made an effort to listen to it because awareness, of course, is the first step toward mm-hmm. dealing with this stuff. And when I realized how strident and how judgmental and how nasty this voice was being to me, I realized I didn't deserve it. I really don't deserve that. And and I and I would and what my friend said, my coach actually said to me was that your mind mixes truth and lies because to be to make it even more powerful. Mm-hmm. So it would start with something that was true for me, but then twist it to mean something that was not true, and that made it that more potent. Piece. Oh my gosh, yes, it was terrible. And I have to tell you that um, it kind of makes me sad because I think my mom and dad didn't realize that that, they, that that was going on for me, mm-hmm. but I learned my lessons really, really well. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was a good girl, and I sat still as much as I possibly could sit still. I I wanted to I wanted to make people happy, so I was really good in school. I was in advanced classes. I didn't even know I was smart. They put me in advanced classes, and I'm like, what, what am I, what's this? I didn't know what that was, so it was nothing I wanted. just showed up for me, and and so I didn't ever go like a lot of folks with ADHD. I didn't ever have that label of, you didn't try hard enough, you're stupid, you can't read, what's wrong with you? I didn't have those voices. I tried super hard. And for many, many, many years, school was the only place that I succeeded. Mm-hmm. The only I sure didn't succeed successfully. I mean, I was socially. I certainly didn't have any friends. I didn't date until I was, you know, like a sophomore in high school. I didn't get kissed until I was a junior in high school, for heaven's sake. So, you Take know. Us there. Where was your first kiss? Um, my first kiss was I, I live on a I grew up on a farm, mm-hmm. and my parents flew their own airplane. 
which they had a really bumper year. We, we lived in poverty when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and then they had some really good years, and my dad went out one day and bought a four-seater Cessna airplane. So he learned to fly, and we were at the very small little airport, and my mom learned to fly, and I actually soloed before I was 16. So I got my solo before, so I, cool. before I started driving, yeah. But I didn't ever learn, get my private pilot's license. And there was a guy out there, very tall, lanky guy, black hair. I'm always a sucker for black hair. And um, he asked me out. Nick asked me out. And I'd never really been out, to tell you the truth. And so he, we went out, and it was just very, you know, I sat on one side of the car. He sat on the other side of the car. I'm sure. Awkward and, but he was five years older than I was. So I thought, you know, especially since I was so inexperienced, I was like, what does he see in me? And all that kind of good stuff. I was all nervous. And, you know, I didn't want to eat dessert and all that kind of stuff. I wanted to impress him. And we get, we get back to my house, and I had no idea, but my parents were watching. Oh, no. And so we get out of the car, and he comes around to my side of the car, and he leans over to kiss me, and my parents went through the ceiling the next day. He's pinning you against that car, blah, blah, blah. And here's the worst of it. He's really tall, and I'm pretty tall, too. I'm 5'7", but when he reached down to kiss me, he missed. So we ended up kissing a nose and a chin. So I thought, what's so exciting about this? <laughs> And I didn't have enough self-confidence to say, let's try again. I was so embarrassed, I just ran away. <laughs> if my parents only knew, it was, there was nothing, nothing too sexual oh about that. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and there was the beginning of my awkwardness in relationships. Yes, I think that's where it started. I think that most of my listeners can relate to those moments of awkwardness. <laughs> I know I've had plenty of those. And, you know, feeling like everybody else understands it. And, like, I actually thought they knew the secret. And, and nobody told me. And I kept trying to find out what the secret was, especially with other girlfriends, just mm-hmm. to be friends with me. And I would, and this makes me sad, too, but I would watch them, which is one of the reasons that when I was in therapy, therapists would say that you're other-directed. Because I was other-directed, but that was a coping mechanism for my ADHD. I would watch them, and then I would go home, and I would imitate them in the mirror to see if I could laugh the way they did or hold my head the way they did. And when I was 9 or 10 years old, I would lay under my quilt, which is a chenille bedspread with a ballerina in the middle of it. It was beautiful. I wanted to be a ballerina when I was a little girl, even though I was had, I was pretty chubby and wasn't really a ballerina body. Um, I would lay there, and this even... This even hurts me to even talk about it. But, okay, so maybe I'm going to cry. I would actually rehearse conversations with people. And I would think about what I would say. And then I'd project what they would say. And then I would think what I would say. And then I'd project. And if I got down the road and suddenly I realized it was it was going to go badly, I would back up and I would have that conversation again. And I would try to say the right thing mm-hmm. so that they wouldn't be upset with me and that they would still be friends with me. It reminds me of my my poor little son who's albino and he couldn't see very well, and he would take pennies to school and give pennies to people if they would be his friend. Yeah. Hmm. So we all have those kind of wounds, but just bringing it back right now. This one show off on audio, but I'm, I gotta give you a hug right now. Okay, thank you. I don't want to hurt your ear your earbud there, sweetie. I can absolutely sit here and talk to you. All day. I know, but we have to go. I know, I do. And you know what? I just want to tell your audience that they are so lucky to have a person like you in their lives, which is why I know that your podcast is going to be wildly successful as you do more and more and more of them. And you're inspiring me to do a podcast too, because of course I, I work specifically with women and I do webinars and do all that kind of stuff. But having come from a background of radio and TV, I should be doing this. I love doing this. So now what I have to do is I have to go wash my hair so that I can moderate the panel between Sari Seldon, between Ned Hallowell, and between Tom Brown. And I just want to say to you and to the rest of the audience that about eight years ago I came to my first conference for ADHD. And a friend whom I met and is now here, and she presented today too, um, we roomed together. And I was so glad to have somebody to talk to. And we were both kind of needy at that moment, to tell you the truth. So we clung to each other. And... Um, we both said, you know, one of these days, we are going to be the people who are presenting in that conference. And do you know that today, both of us presented? Awesome. And I, Sari Solden is on a pedestal. When I, you know, like she's on, and I get to sit not only to know who she is and for her to know and say hello to me, but I get to sit there on the same stage with her. So I just feel so incredibly, I don't like the word blessed, but I just feel like my life, I've created my life in a way that Grateful. I never expected. I, and I am grateful. I am grateful. And, and yet I'm not, I don't say that with a, 
oh, thank God, all these things just fell into my lap because I created that. Mm-hmm. Just as your audience can create those wonderful things in their lives, even though even if things look like they're going really badly, I would never be the coach I am today if I hadn't had all that, excuse me, S-H-I, going on in my life. I would not be the person. I would not be tearful with these things with you, nor would I be my authentic self. So thank you for allowing me to share with you, and thank you for allowing me to be here. Well, thank you for spending the time and sitting with me, <laughs> and I'm sure this will be one of many more conversations we'll have. So. Probably not all of them recorded. You but, know all my secrets now. Oh my gosh. This, oh no, not this really. Was, there's that one, and then there's another one. Let's see. Oh gosh, there's probably five more. <laughs> I have pl- plenty of room on the audio. So. <laughs> not today, baby. Uh, so thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Come visit the AD Diva Network if you, if you happen to be in that. That's what I wanted to ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can people reach you? And find yeah, yeah. Yourself? ADDIVA. It's two Ds, not three. And um, it's ADDIVA.net, or you can go to the retreat site, which is ADDIVARetreats.com. Everything will take you there. But my book is Confessions of an AD Diva. A midlife in the nonlinear lane. And I think that it, I wrote it specifically so that people would finish it. And it's written for women, of course, because it talks so about four hormones. Pages. It's four Well, actually, it's got lots of pictures. It's Excellent. got lots of white space. And it's, and it's got big type because people like Beautiful. me need big, pri- big type. And people say that they actually, it's the first book they've ever finished. And they awesome. laugh and they cry. And awesome. I get five star, star reviews on Amazon. And it won first prize in the Indie Book Awards two years ago. And you said it's going to be on Audible. Soon, it is going right? to be on Audible. Yes, as soon as I get the 2,000 word description done, it's all set up, it's all recorded, ready to go, and I'm reading it, of course, because that's my thing. So Excellent. And you know you can get a free trial, a 30-day trial, and you can download this book for free at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. There you go. Perfect. Yay. And thank you so much. Thank you. Love you. ADHD Rewired listeners, you have just listened to another episode of ADHD Rewired, Conversations from the ADA Conference. We have a few more interviews that you will be hearing over the next couple weeks. Next week, I will be sharing the interview that I had with Terry Matlin. You know, as I listen to these interviews, I keep thinking that, well, this is one of my favorite ones. They're all really great. We actually talk about parenting with ADHD and talk a bit about overwhelm. So I would encourage you to check out next week's episode. Please, if you have not done so already, go into iTunes or Stitcher. Don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss an episode and leave a rating and review. It really helps because it helps the algorithms for how people find this podcast. Don't forget, this is the pre-launch phase right now of the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. While it is possible that this is long over by the time you listen to this, if you are listening between the weeks of August 11th through August 15th, this is pre-launch week, and I am offering this group, a 12-week productivity group, online at a discount. So go to ADHDrewired.com and click on the iMac icon that says registration or something like that. I'm not looking at it right now, so I don't quite remember what it says. Coming back from that tangent, I'd like to know what you've been thinking about ADHD Rewired now that I've been doing more interviews. Are there things that you would like to hear that I haven't been covering Go on the Facebook page or our community group and leave your comments. Or you can go to my website, ADHDrewired.com, and leave comments under each episode's show notes. You can also sign up for my email newsletter that I promise I will send it out to you much less than I actually intend on. So don't worry about me sending spam to your email inbox. Chances are you're not listening anymore because we're 57 and a half minutes into this episode. I know these interviews have been longer, but the cool thing about podcasts is you can push pause. Thanks again to Linda Rogley. This is Eric Tivers reminding you, success is a direction. When you fail, make sure you fail forward. Until next time.